Sorry. I'm ha I have like very weird internet right here where I am. Um, so we're just gonna need to do a couple quick things. Uh, Michelle, can you, if you look at my picture, yes, me. and you put your little arrow, yes, uh, mute on there. You see those three little dots? No, yeah. don't mute. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to mute? You sounded so enthusiastic. <laughs> I know. I was uh, like, you want me to mute? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there is there one that says uh, make host? Oh, yes. Can you do that? Oh, I see. It says change host. It's a. Yep. I now am you're. The host now. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'm just gonna. Wow, that's. I'm so just cool. gonna make Kelly a co-host. I know how to mute. So that in case I lose connection. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, don't I know just. know if you can now that I'm oh. <laughs> host. <laughs> I can mute you. Too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was really fun. So Kelly is a co-host now. In case I lose my internet connection, um, now I see you. So. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hmm. And if you haven't looked at everyone on the other pages, and you want to, please take the time. Yay. Ah, a fireplace. Wow. <laughs> Ninety, ninety eight degrees here. <laughs> okay. It's about 50 something here. <laughs> hmm. I'm about just about an hour outside of Sucre, Bolivia, and about to start a retreat for the next month. So, this is my little farewell Sunday sitting for a few weeks. And Michelle will have all the power. For a month, Just muting, unmuting at will. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, let's sit together for a little while. Just taking your time to gently come into your seated posture or whatever posture you find yourself in right now. getting a sense of all of the sensations in the body. Sensations and sound, sight, smell, taste. all the sensations that may be arising and passing in the heart, mind. Being very careful with each of these phenomena Our attention has so much power, has so much impact, its quality matters. 
It's investigation. It's rejection. It's clinging. Hatred. We wield this incredible force of mind. And have so much responsibility for its relationship to each moment of our lived experience. And so it's worth trying our best to bring these beautiful qualities to bear in relationship to whatever is happening internally, externally, in any of the sense realms, sense spheres, and worth giving ourselves the time and space to explore just what it feels like to care. Care for all of these phenomena as they're expressing themselves. coming to be and passing away. We feel so many sensations in the body. Light tingling to intense pressure. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. So maybe more neutral. Can we take the time to care for each one of them? These fleeting moments. Some may seem more persistent. But we can recognize that they're just coming and going on their own. We have such a short time to behold them. Can we find a place of tenderness in the heart? For each experience of warmth, coolness, hardness, softness, moisture, dryness, pressure, movement. Can we receive these fleeting moments with a tenderness of heart, caring for them whether or not we approve, just because they exist, we can find our connection. to their worthiness of being cared for. And when we are able to, even for a moment, receive a sensation with care, with love, tenderness, 
we also receive that tenderness in the body. Even if it's fleeting, even if it's light, there's a softening. The body not needing to defend itself from the mind, from attack, from manipulation and preference. Sometimes maybe we simply feel the range of experiences of the body or just arising and passing in a field of tenderness of the mind. The body, not ours. The love, not ours. but mutually reinforcing one another in degrees of tenderness, care. Sounds arise and pass. And can we meet them with the same quality, attuned to their fleeting nature, like shooting stars, can our love meet each sound from its birth through its life to its death? Is the mind itself softened by this care or sounds? Is there any place of relief or even a moment of antagonism is surrendered? And similarly, we find these sounds arising and passing. Almost in a field of tenderheartedness, of love. Not concerned with preference or outcome. Receiving sound on its own terms and finding a connection of care. Not abandoning the body. Attuning to these streams of experience arising and passing. Some moments of care can keep meeting. Moments of body, moments of sound, moments of sight, of smell, of taste. The dexterity of the mind the fluidity of this love 
bound. Able to meet whatever sensations arise in the physical sense doors. And of course, in the mind itself, thoughts streaming, images streaming, emotions, imaginings, wanderings, wandering, not wrestling with the mind. Not antagonizing it. Receiving this fleeting stream with the same quality of care. Feeling the relief when we can of putting down our weapons. Receiving each moment of life internally, externally. The sensation of recognition the worthiness of love for every part of it. And when we do find that connection, feeling the goodness of it in our hearts, our minds, our body, feeling the relief and release the nourishment of metta, unconditional tenderness, care. Fueling itself wherever it's found.
finally found a bell. No bells in Ecuador. Plenty of bells in Bolivia. So Michelle and I thought that we would uh, take some questions if anybody had any uh, about your practice uh, in any way that we might be able to support. Uh, we'd be happy to try. And so the, the best way, as usual, to do that is at the, the bottom of your little Zoom screen, like, just like Graham has done. There's a Reactions button. You could click there and then raise your hand and we'll see that you have a question. If that doesn't work for some reason, um, uh, type a little something in the chat that you have a question and we'll, we'll uh, call on you or flail around and we'll try to see that. Um, okay, hold on. Where did Graham go? Did he? I can't see your hand anymore. Graham, do you still have a question? Oh, hold on. My thing is weird. What is it? Ah, oh, okay. Can you see him? He's yeah, I, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, he just ended up typing it in the chat here. So what is attachment? And how do they arise? What is an attachment? Uh-oh. Michelle, what is an attachment? <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, it is when the mind um, actually if you look at me it's easier to describe because it's like the mind the chitta is here yeah uh, consci consciousness and technically it's when um, there is a flow of uh, reality, appearances at all the six sense stores moment to moment, right? They're seeing, hearing, touching, telling, touching, <laughs> smelling, uh, thinking, uh, emotion. It's like there's this range of experience that's happening moment by moment. And it's um, simultaneously with each moment of hearing or smelling or thinking, et cetera. There's a pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral mental feeling that happens simul simultaneously with contact. And so that um, if there is a moment of a pleasant feeling, then if we're not aware of it, usually the um, mind will... Um, even before it, it might change to neutral or unpleasant, there will be a way in which the mind will start to want it to last, right? Or want to make it more, or but but particularly around, there's ways in which the mind will, under, like with with enough experience, of course, for all of us as humans, we know it. We know it's not permanent, but but there's a way in which we we. Um, like it so much and we're not aware of that liking and wanting and enjoying and and so the attachment is when we aren't aware of that sequence from pleasant to liking to enjoying to um craving clinging attachment right like there's this and but what the the actual energetic of it is that there is a grabbing on that's why it's called attachment. And that, that what we're doing is we're, we're actually misperceiving reality because actually what the wanting, the pleasant is actually that the object, wanting the object is missing that actually the pleasant feeling is actually happening in the heart center. It's a moment of sound that's pleasant, right? It's a moment of a thought being pleasant. It's a moment of a physical sensation being pleasant. That's what's interesting. It's like we get fooled into thinking that we're um, going to get something um, that is actually impermanent. <laughs> and it's so sad because we get fooled. We, 
it's like with the aversion, we're afraid of the object or pushing away the object, but it's the same thing. It's like we're getting we're getting fooled by the object that's moving and changing rather than getting the the um the the aversion and the fear are the same experience in the heart. It's a it's a grabbing on. Um and if you look at it carefully, what's really fun about it is that when you start to pay attention to more less intense pain or less intense pleasure and you see that that it's naturally moving like there's a sound and then a thought and then a body sensation and a sound and it it is like a very like jesse said in the instructions it's very fast it's very fast moving like a fast moving river or stream um, and actually we actually can't stop it like this this grabbing on is an attempt to stop the change but actually it it still keeps changing even if we grab on um but it it it's really um it takes a, i think a lot of it, the care the tenderness the kindness the compassion the ability to um be willing the buddha called it the suffering that end suffering. It's that willingness to take responsibility for feeling, experiencing the aversion or experiencing the fear or the attachment to let oneself actually um, grab. If the attention's grabbing, not to say, don't do that and, and have aversion to it because we then we don't understand it. And then we just give more power to it rather than going, ah, ah wanting. <laughs> I was I was hoping I was I could get a, you know practice with learning how to be mindful of wanting. And in that way, out of that acceptance, it doesn't have power over us. We're not and we can then we can pull back from the object. Because it doesn't really matter what the object is. It's like it's it's like if you're wanting chocolate or sex or you know a great sitting or whatever it is that it's like that when you start seeing it none of that is important what's important is you pull back the attention from the object that's the that's the accomplishment and then you feel actually how painful it is to be out of touch with reality to be out of touch with that the that you can't control it Upandita, I remember the first three month retreat with him. He came in one night for a Dhamma talk and he said, I'll never forget it. He said, Well, he was a monk since he was seven years old. So I have to like clarify that. And he said, um, How long can you really kiss? And I was so shocked that he even said it. Like I was just like electrified, but that he even said it. But it was funny. It's like, <laughs> he's like, How long can you actually do it? And I, I was thinking some people would have probably said, well, a pretty long time maybe, but he's like, eventually it's over, right? Like, it's like, there's nothing, even something very pleasant. There's nothing you can sustain. And actually it's, if you did, it wouldn't be pleasant anymore. Like how many cookies can you eat? You can probably eat a lot, but eventually it won't be pleasant anymore. Even sleep. You know, it's all these things that, um, I don't know, I could go on, Jesse, but I think that the thing that's so important, again, with the Brahma Vihara of Mudita, it's another option of, like, dealing with pleasant and liking and enjoyment, because at that place where the Buddha always says you can cut the chain, you can get free of this chain of dependency on experience and on um pleasantness like the the dependency on it um to be okay that that you can turn on the enjoyment and appreciate it you can appreciate that there is pleasant you can appreciate that there is beauty uh, in the world you can um start to say i appreciate the joy in my life or you're not trying to get rid of pleasure you're not trying to get rid of joy you're trying to cut through 
the attachment to it. So that's like how I'm going to end your question because it's it's the attachment that's the problem, not the pleasure. Yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. I'll just kind of maybe highlight a couple of things that Michelle said that if it's not as familiar, it might be important. I've just um because there is a way that you know conventionally this notion of attachment is something not you know i'm attached to cookies mother my identity job what cookie, <laughs> cookie. Uh, but there is something really important about the what michelle is describing to recognize that this tradition and this approach this method is is focused not on that kind of like mm, conceptual level of things, but in the kind of momentary experience of attachment arising and passing in accordance with the arising and passing of pleasant or unpleasant or neutral objects, right, that occur in a mind moment. And um, so you could have a different answer from like a Western psychological perspective of like, where does attachment come from and what is it about? Uh, so just to sort of notice that like that that's very significant about what Michelle is describing of just like that we're not relating to it in these sort of like more general terms and there's a word I'm not quite it's like kind of three dimensional terms it, it's like in the momentary experience of a pleasant sensation that attachment arises you know just as she described if and this is the question what part of what you said is like the question is how does it arise and again, you know, sort of Michelle, just to kind of highlight that, that it arises because of ignorance. That's like the, the kind of, it's, not, it's like a heavy word to use maybe, right? But it's, it arises out of this misunderstanding of the nature of things. And that it's dependent upon that misunderstanding to arise. And that if there wasn't that misunderstanding, if, we, if, if the mind fully fathomed the, the constantly changing, constant flux, uh, nature of phenomena right the conditioned nature of all uh phenomena then it wouldn't grasp on it wouldn't grab onto them right there is this that 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 is how the practice works at undoing this boundness that we have to the pleasant unpleasant or neutral experiences of in any sense or is that through the going through it right just as michelle's describing it's like going through it over and over again we become disenchanted with the prospect of pleasant experience persisting because we just know it doesn't and that it's not worth living a life trying to kind of like recreate moment by moment of, of pleasure. Um, again, like she's saying, it's not that we reject, that it's not like we don't um, appreciate pleasant experience when it arises in whatever form it does, but that is a very different, cleaner relationship, right? That doesn't lead to suffering. Mm. Thanks for the good question. Uh, Gina, you're next, and then David. Hello, hello. Hi. Um, so my question is, and I feel silly asking it because Michelle, in your Dharma talks, you'll say the instructions, but somehow I I lose them in the moment. But essentially, it's um, I will have like a very intense kind of like somatic pain like um it's kind of like an emotional body that's just like very strong and when i sit it's just so it's just too strong so i will try to go somewhere else but when i do it just it's just like banging very loudly to come back to it but um it's actually had me pause my practice because it's just it's just too challenging. So um, I'm going to write down your instructions for dealing with the um, the banging on the door. <laughs> mm. uh, it, I'm just going to change the subject a little bit um, just to um, give an example that it's probably not going to be helpful at all but i think it's a it's like a good start and i sometimes i say things and they don't make sense but i i lost where you are oh, are you there 
She just unraised her hand. So she, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, hi. Okay. Anyway, so um, please know I'm going somewhere with this, but it's not the first thing to do. Please don't write them in order. That's like I'm not that linear an answer, answerer. Um, well, I think that the first year, like I got exposed to these teachings when I was in Massachusetts at IMS. Um, there was a teacher named Sansa named that was invited to give a talk at the three month retreat. And um, he was very different. He was like this big Zen master in gray robes. And he, um, and he described basically how to work with anything difficult, which, which I, there's something humorous about it. That's why I'm saying it. And he said to treat everything like a backseat driver. And so he he's like, you're driving the car, you know, you're describing a very loud, right? Like, you know, <laughs> uh, intense experience. But he would say, you know, thoughts, like body, everything. He'd say, shut up. <laughs> Sorry, I just like, it was so different. Like, he was just like, shut up like, and leave me, let me drive, right? But there's also something kind of... Um, It's so extreme, but also there are times where you basically are telling me that's what you want, right? Right? And so it's funny, but it's real and that there are times when we just have to slam that door and just like, no, like firm, the firmness of the um, necessity for space, right? That you know that that's a way of taking care of yourself is really important. Like for all of us, this is not like uh, availability 24 seven when we don't have enough mindfulness, courage, Brahma Vihara, right? It's like, and in, in a way, I know I can be blunt, <laughs> but it's like, it's unwise. It's actually unwise to let the stuff in the door all the time when we're not strong enough to actually connect with it, right? So you know that already. I can, you know, you know that you see it, but it's actually hard to do because the the more you start to get a relationship with this stuff, the more you actually want to do it, right? You want to take care of that part of yourself, and so it there there is a way in which um, we all remember when we first started practicing and a thought would come by and, uh, <laughs> you know, you'd note thinking, but it would be with a baseball bat. You'd like hit the, try to hit a home run with it, right? Rather than, ah, oh, ha, 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 think another thought, <laughs> right? Thinking that it's a, there's a gentleness that can happen when a Brahma Vihara is present or when mindfulness is present. There's a way in which there's a, a flexibility. And then that's what, ultimately we're we're looking for and so the, the way that i feel like i learned that the best was with physical sensations initially not with a, emotion was difficult emotion was too hard particularly karmic knots um because you drown in them so easily the identification the resistance is actually the suffering but it's like so learning a lot of the um three months with Upandita where he didn't tell tell me to do it, but I started to learn to do it, which was if there's an intense, intense sensation, meaning pain, in say this in the knee, um, that if the the usual way that was taught with mindfulness was always to go in, right? Always to go in, always feel it, right? Like and I started to see that that was not a wise strategy actually because with really painful things you 99 percent of the time you're not going to have the strength you don't have enough practice with it yet right so the idea was that i started coming around the space around it but not going too far i wasn't going to sound you see the difference it's like in terms of space and where your attention is i started this is the practice of finding different places with your awareness to be with things and so i started not my attention was not in the pain at all but if something's really painful this is the hard part is it's going to 
it's going to come up again. You know, it'll call your attention right away. So that practice is one of, of course, the attention gets called, it moves away. The attention gets called, it moves away. Can't be with it at all. Go to a go to the sounds, right? It calls the attention, go back to the sound. That practice is everything. And so like the, abil the ability to go, actually, sound isn't helping, <laughs> right? I need to do compassion. Okay, sound, compassion's not helping. I'm gonna stand up. Standing up isn't helping. I better go for walking meditation. Walking meditation is not happening. I better do go for a walk. The walk didn't really help. I better take a bath. Do, do, do you see? I think you mean watch a movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so you, what I learned was that all that was wise, not bad practice. Uh, yeah, I think what you've given me is the permission because sound is usually a safe space. But then I'm like, you know, not I'm not attending to the thing that's banging down the door. But I love I feel like what I'm taking is like, just find the safe space, like, until you find it. The safe space is everything because it's not going to help to keep trying to be with something when it we, all uh, this is all that I learned in that retreat, actually, in 84 was I was reinforcing a version by trying to keep staying with it. If I keep staying with it and not having the strength, I kept getting more and more aversion to it. That's not a safe place. Yeah. And so you, you can shut the door for two days, three days, five weeks. The time of that doesn't matter. Because what matters is that you have the courage to build up the strength by moving away and have the courage to move into it when you have the strength so that your both actions are motivated by the same thing. It's not motivated by striving to get get something out of being with it, right? Or like to, to feel like you're a good practitioner by being with it, that all that motivation goes away because you start to understand that it it's not the object that matters. It's the quality of the attention that matters. And you might have some questions about that, Jesse, and you might want to add. I mean, Jesse and I can talk about this for days, you know, weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of it is, again, just like really reinforcing the. <sighs> Hold on. Sorry. Um, <laughs> reinforcing. The degree to which we have to actually totally change our mentality about something like this, it, you can't really overstate it. The, the depth to which our training is to go in, right? And whether it's a Vipassana training or it's cultural or whatever, right? The sense of like, it's like you go in and you're going to fix it and you're going to tend to it and you're going to deal with it and you're going to resolve it and you're going to heal it and you're going to be the person you want to be. And like that, that framework is it has its place and it's a, you know it's what gets a lot of us involved and committed to practice and and yet you come to these places right these where these profound entanglements of body and mind heart you know emotion and and physical pain or complexity and you realize that you have to do what michelle is saying which is like you have to totally transform your training which is like how do you train the mind to move away and that that is very counterintuitive on like a bunch of levels. And so I just, it's like to really acknowledge how hard it is to do that and how hard and how humbling it is, right? Because it's not satisfying to the ego uh, on like a, these important levels. And there's something like worth noting in that, right? Where it's like, oh no, this is not the version of me that's like the fantasy version. This is like the, and it's like the, I mean, the gorilla version, right? Where it's like, you're overwhelmed, things are, you run, you run to the hills and you stay in the hills as long as you need to. And that like you, and that actually we even have to let go of the idea that 
it's all about eventually getting back to the thing, right? And that once you're okay, once you're grounded, once you're safe, then you'll be able to go back into this thing. And then it might be like, actually, you don't need to. That actually, there's a universe, like, do you feel like you need to like go into every black hole in the universe? You know, or does the mind have the sense of like power to not be so bound by certain very compelling entanglements? And I guess that would just be the other thing. It's like a lot of times, these are these are places of where, where the mind and body are, are are so entangled. They are places often, whether it's visible, whether there's content or not, of like profound identification uh, also. And this sense of kind of existential threat or and or possibility of like um this this hoping that like through this i will be whatever right and and it's something to be skeptical of right this sense of actually by engaging it that part of why it's so compelling is not just that it's very painful right it's compelling because there's some part of us that feels very identified with resolving it and that it's just something to be it's another aspect to be very careful about right it doesn't mean reject it doesn't mean, you know, whatever, but it means be careful with that and see that actually maybe going to something more neutral um, might not have a sense of satisfaction in it, right? It, it might feel like you're, in fact, abandoning yourself in this, right? That there is a way that that can feel very threatening to go to something that's not this thing. Um, but that's why you do it in small doses. That's why you practice in like little, you know, you you, you just, you do it, you try little things and, and um and see how it feels for a few moments and see how it's compelling it is to go back and 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 be more and more honest about that sort of aspect of the dynamic i think the last thing i'll just say is it's that it can you have to be with the this level of kind of karmic not you just be really patient you know what i mean it's really the sense of like okay this is this is going to be a this is not going to just go away right and your your dance with it right now is really important and and that sense of like there might be times where you feel like you need to really pause on your practice on this kind of practice right this aspect of practice of like sitting formal meditation or that you reduce it right that you you're like here's here's the amount of time i can sit where i feel like i can kind of be with this in a healthy way and when it starts to slide into something that you feel like you can't get out of you just stop Right, and that that may be a very humbling amount of time that that you can actually sit, and that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of other things that are still practice, generosity, good. I mean, there's like all kinds of practice in life, right? Things that are important and valuable. They're going to be building up these beautiful qualities of heart um, and and mind, and and um, that might be sort of like, yeah, you you start to get a sense of like, well, for this period of time, what's the relationship you can have with the sort of seated practice? And, you know, be willing to experiment and explore and be careful about feeling like it needs to be associated with a certain like number of minutes, you know, your practice versus like you're interested in yourself actually <laughs> and you're interested in taking care of yourself and understanding what's happening versus like forcing something through you know i actually do have more to say if that's okay about it yeah i and because i think it's so um immensely important for everybody uh it's, it's, you know, every single thing that we've said could be expanded into a lot of stuff. But I, I think I just also wanted to ask you to remember that um, just because the attention moves away, and that's why I brought up something like the knee rather than, you know, anger or grief or, you know, like an emotional issue, but the, it's all to me, it's, emotional, mental, or physical pain, where Jesse and I are talking about all three of these, you know, not just one or the other, but it's with physical sensation, it's easier to describe 
moving away because there's a spatial aspect to it that's easier. So say you do go to sound as a safe place. Um, I want to say it again, that that doesn't mean that that pain won't call your attention again over and over. And it's part of the practice is learning how to, to deal with that because that's another aspect of this that's hard. It And karmic knots are like quicksand. So a deep emotional pain that's been triggered, right? Like it, it hasn't been present and then it kind of explodes. Um, even if it's a difficult conversation with somebody, like we have to see that this stuff is happening. You know, we listen to something on the news and, you know, like it just like hits like crazy, right? We can shift, go for a walk, but that doesn't mean that the heart doesn't go with us on the walk, right? Or like the, the pain doesn't do come with us with whatever. So again, it's that sense of like, what's the motivation? What are we doing? And the more you learn how to move away, the more you are able to move away Do you see? and stay away more. It's a practice. It's not like you get it right away because we're talking about what becomes predominant. And when something becomes predominant, it's going to call the attention. And so what you do is you start making the neutral more accessible through difficulty with practice. So if we're having a big aversion attack, most people don't naturally incline to metta. It's a, it's a joke, right? It's an understatement. But with practice, right, that anger can even get stronger and stronger, but there's more practice of getting a relationship of kindness with it or compassion, right? But that's not where we start. It takes time, right, to access it. And then if we can't do that again with all of the stuff, if you can't, you, you don't push it right? You don't try to do metta anymore, right? You do, you do something else. So this is, this is what can be tricky because having the faith that one is actually getting more strong, particularly with very difficult things, um, even old age, <laughs> whatever, you know, it's like, uh, it, it does take that sense of remembering the patience it took to get through such and such and that such and such and that I'm sure you've done enough practice that you know what Jesse means by the patience. It takes a, it takes a lot of patience, but you'll see that it's that understanding motivation that is the most important part of the strengthening process. Hmm. Thanks, Tina. David. Oh, David. here you got to unmute there. There we go. Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, I think in answering Gina's question, you may have answered mine, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, First, do I have time to tell a short Bolivia story? Maybe not. I <laughs> maybe you can send a send send an email or whatever. I'd love to hear it. But I it I think let's let's start with the practice thing and see where where okay. we go. I am intrigued, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I I've been practicing for a few years, six seven years. Uh, maybe eight, ten years ago, I started having symptoms of this disorder I have now called cerebellar, spinal cerebellar attack. Yeah. It's a progressive neurological disorder. And basically, it means that I've had pleasure of watching my body go to hell. And mostly, I've been, you know, okay with that. I mean, I don't love it, but. How it is. Um, and I think actually I do, I've held her pretty well. Like now I walk with the walker um, and stuff like that. 
my dog took Mose to myself because I don't think I've ever told anyone, but took it all in stride, even as my stride has been taken. Um, but all these things, you know, sometimes the speech, vision, balance, walking, um, fine motor co coordination of hands. Um, I've been able to rationalize or be okay with. Uh, like years ago, I lost the ability to write, but I was okay with that because I could keyboard. I could still then do an email or write a story or something, and it was no big deal. Or it wasn't that big a deal. Um, in the last two weeks, it started to be really painful to keyboard. <laughs> And it brings up, it has brought up all of this stuff like, oh my God, am I going to be able to feed myself? Uh, wheelchair is great if you have control of your hands, but if you lose your hands and your arms, how does the wheelchair help? And blah, 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 blah. All of that is, is that okay or not okay, but it just is. My problem and my question is, um, whenever I'm quiet, like I'm sitting, I'm filled with thoughts, all future oriented, all not all that pleasant. And I'm kind of wondering, how do we get back in touch with my uh, present, with the present moment at the end? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love, I love, there's something like so pure and beautiful and humbling about, you know, just like the way you have, whether it's something you were born in this lifetime with or that you've cultivated or both, Right, that you have been able to like ride something that would be ride something very difficult <laughs> and and that for many people would be be emotionally overwhelming from the get-go, right? Uh, that that you have like found your way into it with this equanimity. Not that there of course hasn't been sadness and grief and loss and I'm sure all the whole you know gamut of emotions but that you have found your way with the tools you have and the, the heart you have cultivated to like and you know what we aspire to right that's of like around equanimity and around grace and gracefulness with the reality the uncontrollable reality of some of these things you know in our lives and so I just think there's something so wonderful about that. And that and then there's just yes, it's like when do you hit the 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 like okay, that's I've hit, I've now hit the part where there where you've stretched it to the max to your capacity, you know? And that now is like growth time, right? And it's like a different it's a different kind. I mean, not that you haven't been I mean, you know, you have been engaged in this and that there has been you know, a lot of growth, I, I can feel it in terms of just like, okay, showing up for this level and showing up for this level. And, and yet, and yet something happens, something shifts, where it just is beyond our capacity for equanimity and acceptance and connection to all, you know, these heart qualities that we long for. And there you are, you know, just with it. And I, and I, I just, I don't know. I just think there's something really pure in that and beautiful and hard, you know, so it's, I don't, I don't want to downplay like the agony, you know, that must be there at times and the terror, you know, that must really be there about the future. Um, and I, and I'm my, you know, and I'm sure Michelle will have more to say, but you know, my, my initial feeling is like, you're, you're seeing it right you come to sit and like your mind is just 
gone. It is just hooked on this thing and the future fears and the future concerns, totally understandably, of course, you know, and and I would say that from, you know, my experience, from our experience, the, the, the place is often going to be like, you know, you're, it's kind of like you said, it's, it's not unrelated, right, to what we were just talking about. There is this overwhelming experience that's happening. And there's the part of it that you can um, see and, and it's really hard to try to bring the attention elsewhere, right? Because you try to go to the breath and it's, it, there's something so, there's something can feel so irrelevant about like the breath, right? When, when you have something that feels more existential happening in the heart and mind. And so in some ways I would say, kind of like what Michelle's initial inclination was back, you know, in her early retreat there, it's like, actually, what is it to like go maybe a little bit more right around the outside of the thoughts so that like, it's very hard to watch the thoughts themselves usually, um, but we can, you know, there is a way that it's like, what is it like to actually just watch the thinking, right? To stop fighting this and try to, but actually, what is the difference between not fighting it, but not buying into it and actually watch the thoughts happening? And, and usually the way into that and to stop that sort of war is through the feeling into and the acknowledgement and the, the building a relationship with um, the emotional quality, right? So it's like the terror, the sadness, the grief, you know, whatever things might be there, you know, that there is some place where it's like, it's not really the thoughts we think the thoughts are the primary object because that's what we're sort of like noticing the most but that there is the kind of emotional sphere which is in the same realm of you know mindness and thought you know emotion but it's a little bit different qualities right it doesn't have the same um you won't always have the same like uh like it won't have language associated with it right like thoughts will be in words emotions aren't necessarily going to have that and so some of it is starting to try to like feel into where is the emotion and what is the emotion and is there a way that you start to bring that field into focus a little more so that you see that it's like okay the thoughts and the emotions and and these are and you start to understand the sort of cycle of those things in relationship to the body sensation right because I imagine you feel a sensation in the body, sometimes that evokes the emotion. And then the, the thought is and sometimes in a way of like keeping us outside of the emotion. It's a, it's a concretizing of the mind away from what can feel so unstable. Um, so there's a sense of like, if you start to include these other aspects um, that are happening in the field, it, it could be, it might feel very messy but it, it'll be honest right it'll it'll feel like you're you're not in denial of sort of like some of this other aspect um so that i don't know what michelle will offer but this is the like letting things get messier version of vipassana right which is like you're actually including the emotion and you're including the body as like a, a way to sort of start to see how these things are kind of like conditioning one another you know and in that way, it doesn't have, you start to, you have the possibility of losing the, the identification with the intensity of it and the voltage of it, but also like you understand it. It's like, well, there's fear. <laughs> and it's really hard to feel that fear, right? There's, there's like incredible sadness. There's incredible whatever it is. And it's very hard to actually feel that and just hang out in that space of the emotion. But often if we can find a way to safely feel like we can feel those feelings, there's a way that the mind can quiet down. The mind doesn't feel like it needs to keep us out of the emotions in such an intense way. And that we go a little more into the emotional and then you know the, the dynamics between the mind and heart and body that happen in that kind of space. Or Michelle, any thoughts? I think I do. And um, I feel like you covered that so well. I, I'm just going to go in a different direction that will or will not maybe be helpful. So um, I'm just a few 
recollections actually of like when my um, grandmother got really old, she went blind. There was no treatment for glaucoma at that time. And I noticed that um, she just couldn't adjust to it. Like it was just um, so scary for her. And of course, there weren't home health aides back in those days or anything. But I noticed that she had a, she'd sit in the chair and she had a Kleenex box on her lap and she just held on to it so tight. Like it was, um, the transition at that age was just so difficult. And she, and she tried and she had a lot of um, spiritual faith. Um, in her tradition of being Baptist, but um, I'm just, I'm going to give you a few snippets like that, this, because it's, it's important. Um, I had a student that was, I don't know, 50s or late 50s that got Lou, De Lou Gehrig's disease. So much younger than my grandmother, um, but it was like, again, the sense of, um, working with knowing that the breath was going to get less and less um, um, available and it would eventually die sooner than later. And uh, I worked with her a lot on um, am, to ask herself the question when she'd hit the fear and the breath getting difficult, am I okay right now? Like, am I okay right now? Because when we, we project the, de the deterioration onto the future, it's just, it just sweeps over. But if we can remember that actually, and that in these moments, we're okay. It doesn't, it's not an argument with the fact that <laughs> things are going to deteriorate, but it's much more just getting that there are many moments where we actually are okay right now. And I actually worked with that with her for years like years of like just reinforcing it and reinforcing it and really seeing the moments when she was okay. And also working with the moments when she was swept away with, with the fear, which is important, like not um, feeling there was anything wrong with that as well. But I'm, I'm giving you snippets for reason. I'm going to give you one more, which is a, I could give two, but. Um, <laughs> My dad started to get these really intense intestinal blockages and they'd go in through his um, abdomen um, so many times that he had a patch and they couldn't go in anymore. And he was still young enough so that um, eating was a big issue. <laughs> and I, I didn't, I visited him more in those days than later years, but I would come into the house and he'd be like, no one was really helping him figure out what to do. And he'd be sitting there chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing like one like a little piece of something or other. And he, he was really getting beaten down by just that in those years. I just remember like operation after operation after, after operation. And then um, eventually he just went into drinking liquids. Like first it was... Um, blending food, but then just forget it. It was just like, okay, just liquid. And um, every juncture I saw him go through was one of exasperation, like that he would lose his stride. He would, and just like the same with the Lou Gehrig's disease or my grandmother, which she didn't catch her stride very well, I must say, but it, I could see she just couldn't adjust. Um, but the gift is, is Jesse saying, you have a graciousness, a natural graciousness to maybe lose your stride and bounce back with a different oper way of operating and then bounce back. But you have to, I see that with myself now or with Steve, it's like, you know, personally now, um, that especially when you've had a certain degree of health and then you lose it or you're losing it gradually, it takes a lot of um, willingness to go through the my, walking in and seeing my father just so, so 
sick of chewing, like so sick of chewing. Like, I can't even tell you, you know, right? It was just like, and he, it was the only way he could go at that time. But I think um, I happened to work with a woman who came to, um, I took two weeks off at IMS that had severe cerebral palsy born with it. And she couldn't feed herself at all her whole life. She couldn't move a, an arm or a leg her whole life. She couldn't speak her whole life. All she could do is blink. You know, we had an al we came up with an alphabet where she'd blink and look one way and that was A and blink another way two times, look down, that was B, right? Like there was a way that um, she learned to cope. And like eating a meal took about three hours, three or four hours. Um, and it was not a pleasant thing to be the person feeding her because mostly it was coming back up, right? Like it was on retreat <laughs> going through that with her every day. And just for her to be try to be quiet in the hall was good practice. I used to have to wheel her out all the time because she'd start making all these noises. And the teacher would look at me, okay, time to take her out. But if she had a good sitting, that meant she could be mostly quiet during the city. And sometimes I'd get so tired that, um, and she'd want me to put her out in the sun and leave her. So I, she knew I needed a little break. Um, and I'd come back and she'd be covered with flies. And there was a certain point where I was, I couldn't lift her very well. And I would kind of pick her up and throw her into the bed. <laughs> and one time she hit her head on the toilet bowl. And, oh my God, it was just like so hard. And um, I started sobbing and I said, how do you, I mean, she, I could talk. I, I almost thought I had to do what she had to do, but I said, how, how can you take this? And she said, um, I have to write, I would write down the letters and stuff, but she said, um, you just get used to it. And, and she, of course, had to adjust to that very young. I think if all of us hit that place right now that she was born into, very few of us could do it, actually. It's that hard. You know, that's why I brought up my grandmother. She couldn't quite make the adjustment, but she, you know, she lasted for a while, but it, it was, uh, how many of us could adjust to being blind right now if we hadn't been you know, it's, it's hard, right? So you're, you're getting a hard one to adjust to for sure. I, I'm not just, Jesse said it. I'm not, it's not a, not a lightweight situation and you're doing great. And, um, it's okay to lose it sometimes. That's why I brought up my dad. <laughs> it, he just like gets so pissed off, you know? I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> I just want to say that, that it's okay to lose it, and that's it. It's just yeah. like, how many people are up for it? And it's like, yes, but it, that's the the spiritual potential <laughs> is just amazing, right? Because of what it takes, because of what it's going to take, that like you are up for it, and that you have so much momentum in your practice, and you have yes, it's like you've hit a couple weeks of like doubt <laughs> you know like of course you know like you're it's amazing that it's taken this long to hit a wall that's like no. feels you know catastrophic or whatever and it's like okay yeah this is you know the 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 body is hopeless for every one of us right but the mind isn't and that is the heart of this practice, you know, where it's like the mind 
there is the the spiritual work that can come out of whatever conditions we find ourselves in is beautiful and the potential is there but it doesn't mean that it's not really hard and that hopefully you know we can get as much support in it you know from from us and from whoever you need to get it from you know because it's it's it also isn't just some, the buddha supposedly did it alone but that's he's considered unique in that way <laughs> you know so yeah yeah well, well thank you both you're terrific uh, and you. you helped a lot i would i i would like to hear if you if it's short the bolivia story if you're up for it since who knows <laughs> Um, yeah, this is back a while ago. I was, well, I was in Bolivia. I was in Lake Titicaca, which is bordered by Peru and Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And I was there to see the floating islands. Mm -hmm. So I was on a boat, and I don't know exactly what, if I was in Bolivia or Peru or in both places. Like Bobin says, so maybe you're wondering what else the name, Lake Titicaca. And everyone at Bob said, yeah, maybe. And he said, well, it's titty for us, caca for them. <laughs> I will remember that when I <laughs> go visit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, mm. thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Did um Annie, right? Annie, did yeah. you she unraised her hand? Well, I unraised it because um <laughs> just because I don't I don't, I'm feeling like I can ask at other times. Are you There's saying that the because present you... moment. Is there is there a reason why you're thinking another time might be better? Uh, not necessarily. I don't. Not necessarily. I just well. There may well, not be another time. If you're right, up for a, if yes. you're up for a question, I'll raise my hand again. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Annie, do you have a question? <laughs> um, yeah, I have two questions, but I'm I I will only pick one. Um, I don't sleep well, and uh, I had someone say to me recently, well, you're a meditator, why don't you meditate? <laughs> and I sort of laugh and I go, it's not, it's not my forte because I'm hooked. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say that, but, uh, but I, my, I can be really, really tired and my head hits the pillow and my mind starts going with worry. So I've got a lot of worries. And, um, I, and I, I have a friend who keeps saying, well, just listen to a Dharma talk or listen to a guided meditation, which is what she's able to do. And I can't do that. I can do puzzles. I can play Wordle. <laughs> You know, I can do that kind of stuff, but I can't, um, I can't, I don't know what it is, why I resist doing things. But at any rate, <laughs> um, last night, my head hit the pillow and the things that I have to do started coming in a newsreel. And, um, and so I thought, well, maybe, Maybe I can try using the tool that Stephen taught me during one retreat. Um, and so I did, and I went to sleep, but I need a refresher on the tool. <laughs> and the tool was, um, I, I said that I was irritated by a howling dog next door during the retreat. And he said something like, Create more space where your chitta is 
I don't think he said that exactly, but it was like create a larger perspective. And um, what happened for me in doing that was that my heart opened. And um, I can't, I can't always do it, but I want the instruction again because it was so, it was so powerful for me. That was the beginning of not being irritated by the dogs next door that bark all the time, and particularly the one who howls. Uh, she does this, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and she's a big dog, so it's a big noise. And uh, and I really love her a lot. She is a wonderful dog. Um, so it really it. it somehow changed my whole relationship with her. And now I just, um, I don't, I'm not bothered by the dogs. I don't know. I don't know. But can I do that with worry? <laughs> That's well, the question. The, wor the worry is like a howling dog. It is. So of course you can do that. It's the same. Can I have the instructions again? <laughs> well, well what didn't is you it? say you okay. did it last night? I was going to say the same thing. Um, I did. I tried to create that space in in my chest. Um, I don't. I don't know how I did it because it was really quick. I mean, it's like it was like I was falling asleep like normal people do because I don't remember. I don't remember how I fell asleep. I just remembered, let, let me try and create the space. And then I went to sleep. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. It might be, it might be just asking the question. I mean, cause we could give you 10,000 instructions on like space, making space. Um, but I think like sometimes just touching here, you know, the, the good old Deepama instruction would be to have your hand on your, your heart center and your hand on your belly and just um, create space that way. Because you see, that's pulling you out of your worry thoughts. It's like creating space out of the worry thoughts is just basically leaving them alone and letting them just go along, but making a lot more space for other objects to be attentive to. That's how you make space, technically. Or you can make space by touching here. And um, this, the chitta the, is vast, it's boundless, it's it's got, it's naturally got beyond space. <laughs> so it's like, a, that's like the quantum realm, <laughs> right? The smaller you get, the more space there is. So um, I I think that what I'm sensing is that the tool was actually saying it if you didn't do anything specific and it happened and you asked that question you said that you know make space here then and it happened that's the that's the instruction but it might not work every time you know it's like a the parame of resolution or determination that's like um you incline the mind towards something especially when there's a chance that it might happen and you incline the mind that way and it will start to get strong enough that inclining it, that it'll start to happen more and more. That's what I would recommend. The kicking, kickstarting that parami a little bit more. Um, but I would be careful of thinking you have to get rid of the worry thoughts. I think it's much more, the spaciousness is, is finding more and more, um, that's why we modern people use the word space. Um, it's like a vast blue sky and it's like there's this little distant howling 
<laughs> or if they can't do that, right? You might send, if you love the dog, you'd send compassion to the dog. Right? There's so many things you can do. But my sense is, and I think Jesse's getting, saying, feeling the same way, is that um, it could have been just the way Steve said it, that it had a transmission and impact of something you just drop into. That the technique might not, might be just saying it. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a transmission. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would, you know, it's hard. I would be careful about expecting any trick to work like over and over again, you know, every night. So it's just like, there's a sense of like, you want that key that like got that thing to happen, you know, and it's like, okay, it happened once with Steve, you, you kind of were able to tune into it again last night. And so it's not that it's hopeless, right? It's not that there isn't something that shifts in the mind in order to bring ease in a time where there might be something unpleasant and persistently unpleasant happening internally, externally. Um, and that you have access, like you have now have like multiple experiences where this has the there has been unpleasant phenomenon that has been persistent, and you have found your way into restfulness and and sleep right from that, and you know it might. I think there's like a sense of like maybe it is just a word and there's a sense of like if you can remind yourself and you that works and you drop into it and there's like that that is available that you keep trying it you know i don't mean to say that it's definitely not going to keep working you know sometimes there's these things that that click and that you don't need more method than that right it's just like the the attunement of the mind to that and if the word space it, the notion of space is helping you do that great you know if it doesn't work, you know, if it sort of feels like well, it loses its sort of punch, you know, there is this exploration of like, well, what does that even mean, space? Especially when we're talking about Vipassana, where it's like, we're not, technically, there's no spatial dynamic at all. It's momentary, it's moments in a single dimension of sense contact, right, that are arising. And so it's like, you know, Morse code is one aspect of the nature of reality, right? And so what we call space, is that the same as equanimity, right? Is it the same as like, well, we're just not privileging one sensory experience over the many others that are happening. And we're in the sense of like, oh, okay, we're privileging this sort of particularly unpleasant one, right? The mind is called to it, it's absorbed in it. What is it like to build ease? What is it like to bring, you know, the attention to a wider framework, a wider range of experiences that might not be so unpleasant? It's not that different from actually what we've been talking about with everyone else tonight, right? It's like, it's like anchoring in something else or anchoring, maybe it's not quite anchoring in something else, but also just the sort of opening up of the attention so that one irritating aspect of our existence isn't like, doesn't become the whole universe. And that it's like, oh, within this wider field of attention, this one irritating experience loses its punch, loses its compellingness. And that's very hard to do. It, it's hard to do with a dog outside. And it's very hard to do with our own worry, you know, so that you pulled it off last night with more of the internal mental thing where we're much more identified with, you know, that's significant. So it's, it's, it's like there's... You, your mind has an inclination toward this and you know it might not always be the kind of magic uh you know magic effect every night but i think it's a maybe tr maybe starting to consider it as a exploration rather than um you know sometimes it just feels like yeah we have that sort of desperate need for this thing to work and to change this sort of tendency um if we have a little more sense of like, oh, interest in the exploration, sometimes that also can include a little more sense of the ease that might be helpful. Hmm. 
But Buddha did call sleep the world's greatest pleasure. So we all get hooked. Going unconscious. <laughs> no more sixth sense to our moment from my experience. <laughs> That's what sleep is all about. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with wordle, you know, or puzzles or toast. Toast. When I can't sleep, I get up and make a piece of toast because I like it. If and I sometimes didn't, you can break yeah. out of like, I mean, I don't know what your days are like, but sometimes like we, we have this idea about sleep and our lives that's not always real, you know, and that if you actually did get up and sit for a while and eventually fell back asleep for a while. And, and I mean, actually get up and sit, like not try to sit in bed. That can be hard. It's like, if you're not sleeping, trying to sit in bed, lying down, um, you know, you're more restless than that sometimes, but it's like the sense of like asleep, awake, nighttime, daytime, maybe those aren't as um, real dichotomies, you know, as we sort of often strain them into yeah. worth exploring yeah i definitely get up yeah. <laughs> I, I get up good. that's good great yeah and i do things like cook and <laughs> play games and <laughs> there's a whole thing i don't know about you know I, someone wrote a book that i didn't read uh <laughs> about like how back in the I'm going to make up an era, 1600s, that there was this thing, like people just were like, oh, the third watch of the night or whatever. And it was like, second you just, sleep. yeah, second sleep. Second you know, like sleep. People just got, got up at night. That was yeah. normal. When I read that, I loved it because, yeah. you know, I was, I could get up and do something and then I could have my second sleep. I think that's cool. The happy side, I used to just show what he did. To me, he'd jump up and he'd be like, okay, you know, and he'd like make offerings to the Buddha, like, and it, like, and he'd go around and clean his kuti. And like, he just like, there didn't feel like there was any problem with not sleeping. It was an opportunity to like make more offerings to the Buddha for him, you know, he, it was cool. Just like there wasn't a feeling like he was being deprived of anything. It was more the sense he was given the opportunity to practice more or like make offerings or, you know, he didn't see it as something negative. And apparently, I, I don't, this is something else I heard, but I have not read. But you know how there's all these scientific you know, or sort of quasi scientific things about how useful meditation is. And, uh, but uh, apparently, <laughs> it's been proven that it is not helpful with sleep, that it that it's it inspires wakefulness, right, which is actually the point, right, it shouldn't surprise us for that. But, um, you know, so that, that it does not mean you're a bad meditator, it might mean that you're excelling at your mindfulness, you know, so feel good about that. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so it's, much. it's true. The whole point of it is to wake up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody. Okay. Take good Reach, care. Have a good retreat, Jesse. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be thinking of you all, sending Meta for sure. Yeah. And see you all next Sunday. Yeah. Thank have you, Michelle, for yeah. holding it. Yeah. Holding it. Yeah. yeah, and everyone for the next while. Yeah, take care. Mm.